Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Operation and Public Safety meeting. Today is uh, Tuesday, April 5th. We're going to get started here today. We have, uh, let's see, we got five things on our agenda item for tonight. Um, let's start off with the roll call, please, Kim. Thank you, Council President. Council President Boyce? Here. Council Member Fincher? Here. Council Member Kaur? Here. Council Member Larmer? Here. Council Member Michelle? Here. Council Member Thomas? Council Member Troutner. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. We're going to move on to item number three. We have the agenda approval. Like I said, we have five things. I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the agenda for tonight. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We'll let the record show unanimous pass. We'll move on to item number four, business. Uh, first thing is item A. Approval of the minutes from March 15th. Move to approve the minutes from March 15th. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show unanimous pass. Move on to item number B, payment of the bills. Entertain a motion, please. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Come on, guys, get with it. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, all in favor, signify by saying aye. So much fun. Aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, let the record show you unanimous pass. Now, let's get down to some real business here. <laughs> item number C, ordinance amendment. My favorite attorney, Tammy White. <laughs> hi, good afternoon. Tammy White, acting city attorney. Um, I won't, don't think I'll be as quick as the other items, but I still won't take too much of your time today. So the ordinance that I'm bringing forward to you today is to amend Chapter 9.38 of the Kent City Code related to parking. And this is to make a lot of consistency changes with what we did to Chapter 9.39 regarding towing. So it amends the penalty provisions to provide that if an officer tows a vehicle, that is to be remedial. It's not to be used as a penalty, so they will not simultaneously also cite them for an infraction. There's one other change that just for organizational purposes I'm recommending be made in this ordinance, and it's to identify um, who in the city has authority when we're dealing with junk vehicles to authorize their removal from the right-of-way. So Kent City Code, we adopt the model traffic ordinance through um, Kent City Code Chapter 9.36. And that's referenced here in section one. If you were to look on page two of the ordinance, it references the model traffic ordinance, which is adopted. So through Kent City Code, we've adopted the state model traffic ordinance, which then adopts other state statutes. And one of those statutes define what a junk vehicle is. So there are certain parameters that have to be in place if an officer um, wants to authorize a junk vehicle to be removed from the right of way. The state law, though, does require that we have to have a public official who has jurisdiction over that public way to authorize the removal. So what this ordinance does is it now identifies the public works director or their designee as the individual having that inherent authority to be able to remove that junk vehicle from the right of way. So with that, I will take any questions. Why do you say junk vehicle? It don't have to be a junk vehicle, do it? Uh, not to tow in general, but there's actually uh, the term junk vehicle is defined by statute, and this is often the ones that really are have no value other than scrap. Okay. So we sometimes get, you know, burned out or gutted cars, RVs or whatnot just kind of dumped along the right-of-way, and so now the city has to deal with removing those from that right-of-way. Okay. So declaring them junk under the statute allows them to take immediate action to remove it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, any question, Council Member? I know we talked about this at your last meeting, so uh, Council Member Core. Not really a question, just a comment. I I agree with that because my when my car was stolen, my mom's car actually, and it was gutted out and left on Kenyon Drive actually, and so it was towed, and then we had to pay to have it removed, and then you know just tossing it away, finding a way to get rid of it. So that was very expensive. So I think I think this should definitely help our constituents. Okay. Any other question, thoughts? Seeing none, I'm going to ask Councilman Fincher to make a motion, please. Uh, Mr. President, I move to adopt ordinance number 4428, amending chapter 3.98, I'm sorry, 9.38, of the Kent City Code entitled Parking to make clarifying revisions. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Let the record show unanimous pass. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to item D, East Hill Police Substation Lease Extension. Commander Grove. Good afternoon. I'm here to provide clarification and a correction on the East Hill Police Substation lease extension um, that I presented last month. So in that original uh, presentation, I had the lease being $1,800 per month with a $7 of controllable expenses. In fact, the $7 are per square foot controllable expenses. So that changes the rate to the tune of 781 additional dollars per month. So the total for that lease extension monthly will be $2,581.72 instead of just $1,800 with a $7 additional controllable expense. Uh, just a reminder, we've been in that space since 2016 and it is necessary for our patrol function. The address is 25635 104th Avenue Southeast. And with that, I'll take any questions on the correction. Commander Grove, what, what was the uh, previous rate? What's the jump in the increase? Uh, the jump, there, there isn't an increase except for the additional cost. So, so did we, I'm sorry, so did we pay $2,500 last year a month? Oh, sorry, no, we didn't. Okay. Uh, I think we were somewhere in the tune of $1,600 last big, month, plus the controllable expenses. So there's not, a, there's not a big increase in that. Say that one more, I'm sorry, say it again now. There hasn't been a big increase, which we're happy about, to that lease extension. Okay. I don't know the exact number, but I think it was in the ballpark of sixteen hundred per month. Okay. Okay. In a uh, question, Council Member, we talked about this before. Commander Grove just bringing it back for some minor correction. Seeing none. Okay, I'm going to ask Council Member Fincher to uh, make a motion, please. Mr. President, I move to authorize the mayor to enter into a lease extension agreement with Kent Hill LLC for an additional five-year term to maintain a police substation on the East Hill, subject to final lease terms and conditions acceptable to, to the police chief and city attorney. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? See and none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show your name is passed. Thank you, Commander Groves. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. We're going to move on to our next item before we adjourn, and we got some legislative uh, report from the session here, and I'm going to ask Brianna Murray to entertain us. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members, and um, you know, my presentation will be a little lengthier than the ones that preceded me, so hopefully you will <laughs> indulge me. I am Brianna Murray, the city's uh, contract lobbyist. I advocate on behalf of the city before the Washington State Legislature and serve as your eyes, ears, and advocate in advancing your legislative priorities. This evening, I'm hoping to provide you with an overview of what occurred during the 2022 legislative session that recently adjourned provide an, a rundown of the outcome of your top legislative priorities, highlight a few additional issues that were discussed this session that were um, not included as part of your legislative priorities, and then cover next steps. Wasting no time at all, I'll dive right into an overview of what occurred during the 2022 legislative session. As you all will recall from our discussions prior to this session, the legislature operates on a two-year cycle, with the first year being a long legislative session and the second year being a short legislative session. The 2022 session was a short session lasting 60 days in duration. Um, and like the 2021 session was conducted nearly entirely in a virtual format due to COVID-19 precautions. Democrats held the majority in the House of Representatives and the State Senate, which meant the Democrat Party really drove the agenda and issues discussed for the 2022 session. All bills that were introduced in 2021 automatically carried over and were continued to be considered in 2022, as again, it is a two-year cycle. In addition to the bills carrying over, 1,156 new bills were introduced. This meant that the legislature had at their disposal consideration of well over 2,000 different proposals. Of those proposals, 309 passed into law, and since this PowerPoint was uh, finalized, six of those 309 were vetoed by the governor, resulting in a total of 303 new bills. 
In addition to the many different policy bills that the legislature considered and the 303 that were passed into law, the legislature also revisited budgets that they adopted at the end of the 2021 session and made amendments to those through the adoption of supplemental budgets. Um, I'm going to go into a bit detail of detail into each of the state budgets. The supplemental operating budget funds all state agency operations. Since the legislature concluded their work in 2021, revenues to that budget increased by over $2 billion. The legislature uh, allocated the additional revenues um, and adopted a total biennial budget of just over $63 billion. Of that funding, $2 billion was shifted to the transportation budget, and they left $812 million in reserves. The capital budget funds bricks and mortar construction, excluding transportation. Um, as a supplemental budget, this budget is funded with, with bonding capacity, and this budget was uh, more limited in funds than either the operating or transportation budget. The total expenditures in the supplemental budget were $1.5 billion above what was adopted in 2021. Um, and um, about 62 million of that 1.5 billion was allocated to local and community projects. By comparison, in the first year of the biennium, 250 million was allocated to local and community projects. You'll recall when I was before you um, in November, December timeframe to approve the, the final budget, I highlighted that the supplemental capital budget would be more limited on funds than it was in 2021, and that was indeed the case. Um, the other investments that were made within the capital budget really focused on housing and homelessness, behavioral health, and local infrastructure, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into the presentation. The most excitement occurred within the transportation arena. For several years, the legislature uh, has been discussing adopting a transportation revenue package, um, and um, each session um, for the last few years, we've been quite disappointed that that did not advance forward. Moving into the 2022 session, we had a new chair of the Senate Transportation Committee appointed and a very assertive statement from both Transportation Committee chairs that they wanted to advance a transportation package, but they did not want it to include any new gas tax. And sure enough, they were able to do that. Um, they, uh, the legislature approved a $17 billion package that will make investments over the next 16 years. They utilized that $2 billion out of the operating budget that I mentioned earlier, as well as federal funds through the um, IAJA Act that was approved earlier in 2022, um, some fee increases and revenue from the Climate <coughs> Commitment Act um, or cap and trade system that was enacted in 2021. Roughly one third of the revenue is dedicated to transit, electric ferries, rail, general multimodal activities, and the other two thirds was de dedicated to maintenance, preservation, um, backfilling funding gaps, and highway projects. We'll get into uh, the impacts for the city of Kent a little bit further as we dive into the legislative priorities. With that overview of, as context, um, I want to spend the duration of the presentation really focused on informing you on how your specific city legislative priorities landed this session. I do plan on just covering the top legislative priorities. In addition to your top legislative priorities, you all also approve a policy document that outlines positions on dozens of different bills. We would be here all night. I know it's already going to feel like we're here all night as you all <laughs> listen to me for the next several slides, but we would be here literally all night for me to cover all those issues. Following this presentation, you will receive a very comprehensive written report from me that's, you know, several dozen pages long, and you're welcome to read through all of the different bills that have passed. But for this evening, we'll focus just on your top legislative priorities. Starting first with community safety. You all will recall that in the 2021 legislative session, the legislature adopted just over a dozen different bills uh, changing how Washington State engages in policing. On this year's legislative agenda, you all included a statement urging the legislature to revisit some of those new laws to provide greater clarity and balance between community safety and needed reform. The City of Kent was not alone in having that statement on its legislative priorities. 
several communities and interest groups had that um, same sentiment, and the legislature responded. Um, the legislature responded with a very robust dialogue of a consideration of many different policies and inevitably adopted three different proposals. The first one is House Bill 1735, which at a high level clarifies that an officer can use force to take someone into custody under civil or forensic commitment laws or exercise court orders. Uh, this has commonly um, been referred to as restoring the community caretaking role of officers um, that became unclear after the passage of 2021 legislation. The second bill is House Bill 2037, which defines use of force in state law and states that force can be used when there is probable cause that a person has committed, is committing, or is about to commit an offense or to stop someone who is intentionally, intentionally fleeing an officer. Um, this is expanded authority beyond what was approved in 2021. And finally, the legislature approved House Bill 1719, which clarifies um, that shotguns can be used to shoot less lethal alternatives such as bean bags and rubber bullets. Um, that was a conflict between two different bills that were passed in 2021 um, that had an unintentional impact. In addition to the three bills that passed, there was a, a, a fourth concept that nearly got across the finish line, and that was making changes to when officers can engage in vehicular pursuits. Uh, the legislature, uh, despite getting very close to passing a bill, um, did not do so in the final weeks of session. I want to highlight that because I anticipate that the legislature as a whole will continue to discuss policing issues um, and the vehicular pursuit issue being one of the um, high priority issues that are, will likely take center stage in future legislative session. In addition to those policy changes, the legislature through their budget um, did increase funding for the basic law enforcement academy. All officers that are hired in Washington State go through the basic law enforcement academy, and historically the academy has been short on funds with extremely long wait lists, creating a large amount of time between when an officer is hired and when they're actually able to begin their job and get to work. The legislature uh, funded 13 additional classes for a total of 43 classes, once combined with 2021 investments, um, in order to address this backlog. The Criminal Justice Training Commission anticipates that this amount of funding and the 43 classes will be sufficient um, to onboard any officers that are being hired. Brian, if you go to the next session, can you talk about what was the conversation around the vehicle pursuit changes? Can you just just a little more dialogue around that? Sure. And, and you know, diving into the details of this, I could certainly uh, keep us here all night. But at a, it, high level, high level. Yeah. at a high level, um, so the law that passed in 2021 um, limits when an officer can engage in a vehicular suit, saying that you have to have probable cause or reasonable suspicion if particular high, um, severe crimes are occurring. Um, and there's a requirement that you get uh, a approval from another um, uh, another uh, uh, individual before engaging in a vehicular pursuit. That has proved to be problematic upon implementation. Um, and so the proposals we saw this session were to roll that back to being um, engaging in, in vehicular pursuits with reasonable suspicion rather than probable cause. And there were different ways of sort of taking a bite at that apple or moving in that direction. Um, and I would, of course, defer um, to, to Chief Padilla um, on this. He's been very involved in all in reviewing all of the different legislation as it's been brought forward um, and informing our, our uh, input into the legislative process. Thank you. So the next top priority for you all was around. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, Councilman oh, Fincher. Yes. With those new classes, the additional funding for the new classes, how many officers would be in a class and how many additional officers do they expect to get trained? Mm, that is a great question. I do not know how many officers per class. I'll have to look at, look into that and follow up with you. Or just a total of how many they expect that that will increase the output. Yeah, yeah. I just know that it's a total of 43 classes. So. Chief, do you know how many in a class, Chief, roughly? I think Chief might know. Feel free to clarify anything on the vehicular pursuits as well. well <laughs> I think you did a great job on that. They, they were looking at resetting vehicle pursuits back to reasonable suspicion, mm -hmm. violent crimes, and I'm positive that's coming back next session. 
the classes were capped at 30, and I don't think the CJTC is going to deviate from that. There's no indication. I met with the current commander of Leah two weeks ago. So this is doubling the amount of classes. I do want to footnote they are having a severe staffing challenge. In fact, they, they can't. ED traditionally has a person on the training staff, and because of our situation, we're not able to staff that, but that's pretty common around the region. So they're trying to build up their training cadre of, of current law enforcement. So, But it should double the amount of recruits going through. Are they confident that they will be able to find enough instructors in all to double that? Confident might be a strong word. Um, hmm. They are very eager and working hard to do it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chief. Any other questions on community safety? Okay. Moving on to transportation then, as I mentioned earlier, the legislature adopted the move ahead transportation package. Uh, you all on your legislative priorities enumerated several different funding requests that you would like to see you would have liked to see funded in any transportation package. And I'm very pleased to report back to you that the Move Ahead Washington package includes funding for all of the requests identified on the legislative agenda. I want to emphasize that not every community had that level of success. Um, in fact, the amount of funds that the city of Kent is receiving in Move Ahead is significant, far and uh, above what other communities received in this package. So you all will be receiving $10 million for the Meet Me on Meeker project um, and $20.6 million for completing the 224th Street project. I was not planning to go through the details of those. My impression is you all are familiar with these projects since you placed them on the legislative agenda. One note is that um, you'll recall I said that they adopted a 16-year package. We are not sure at what point within that 16-year time period the funds will become available for these projects. Mm -hmm. So while mm -hmm. funds have been officially allocated. allocated to the project, we don't know when we will have dollars in hand. And that will likely be something that is determined and discussed in the 2023 legislature. The Move Ahead Washington package also kept several pa several pa pa ugh, several projects <laughs> that we have cared about deeply in previous packages on schedule. Um, through the pandemic and supply chain is issues, projects saw significant increase in costs um, and therefore significant project shortfalls, um, funding shortfalls. On 405-167, the corridor was facing a $450 million shortfall um, that the legislature backfilled with $380 million of Move Ahead Washington funds and $70 million through deferring the collection of sales tax on projects along that corridor. And um, the Puget Sound Gateway project, which includes the completion of State Route 509, was facing just over a $400 million revenue shortfall, and the legislature was able to fill that with $432 million in Move Ahead Washington funds. The other transportation component highlighted on your legislative priorities was to increase funding to local preservation and maintenance. I would say this is an area where the Move Ahead Washington uh, proposal fell short. Um, $80 million over the next 17 years was allocated to the Transportation Improvement Board for grants to local jurisdictions in order to fund preservation projects. The Joint Transportation Committee recently did a study that identified that the unmet funding need for preservation projects across all cities totals over $1 billion. So $80 million um, is uh, kind of a drop in the bucket in meeting that overarching need. I know the Association of Washington Cities is intending to continue to work on how to identify more local preservation and maintenance funds moving forward, and I expect that will be an item that gets continued discussion in the 2023 legislature. Moving on to your next top priority item is housing. This year, the legislature um, expressed a great deal of support for providing housing and addressing homelessness largely through the supplemental operating and supplemental capital budgets. It was unprecedented spending in the arena of housing within the supplemental budgets, with an additional $114 million for the Housing Trust Fund, 
$240 million for rapid acquisition housing, and $100 million for a new program that allows individuals who are receiving state medical assistance through the Medicaid program to receive a voucher for permanent supportive housing. Um, all of those programs, well, the first two of those programs are grant programs and will be issued on a competitive basis. So for the Kent community to take advantage of those, you'll need to work with housing provider or housing partners in submitting applications. In addition to those uh, budgetary items, the legislature also approved House Bill 1643, which was sponsored by your local legislator, Representative David Hackney, to provide a real estate exemption for the purchase of land or properties that will be used for affordable housing. So when a housing authority purchases a property to transition it into affordable housing, the state real estate excise tax is exempt from that purchase. Additionally, the legislature allocated $45 million to transition individuals living in encampments within state right-of-ways in permanent supportive housing. That $45 million um, can be used to place those individuals within housing in addition to cleanup efforts. It is not just for cleanup efforts. We have a question here. Uh, Councilman Lammer, please. I think, Brianna, on the, the read exemption for affordable housing, what, how are they defining affordable housing? Is it the 0 to 30, 50 to 60, or what? what Great matter? question. I believe it's 0 to 60. I can follow up with you. I don't have that detail memorized. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on housing? Oh, uh, Councilmember Fincher. Brianna, is there any way or is there any movement in Olympia to basically untie us from Seattle as far as when figuring out the cost of living and uh, that sort of thing? Because it really drives up the housing cost out here. Uh, you so. mean how we calculate the average median income and the fact that that is a King County number rather than a city specific number. Yes. That, am I mm -hmm. understanding correctly? So that is a great question. It's a policy conversation that has absolutely come up in Olympia, not necessarily related to the specific proposals outlined on the slide there, but they came up, uh, that specific uh, issue came up when um, the legislature discussed the multifamily property tax exemption um, a couple sessions ago, and they were looking at making AMI adjustments within the eligibility for that property tax exemption. And the, the challenge was that my understanding is that AMI number is also linked to HUD and federal funds. So it's not as easy as the state just saying, we want to use a city AMI as opposed to a county AMI. It's tied into this much bigger discussion related to federal HUD requirements. Um, so it, it certainly has been discussed. I wouldn't say there's been any movement on it. I think generally speaking, people are inclined to leave the AMIs the way they are because of um, the complexity with HUD and to instead adjust the, is it 30%, 50%, 60% of AMI, adjust the percentage level to try and get at that concern. Um, I think if that's something that you um, feel strongly about, I'd welcome having a conversation on how to advance that in future legislative endeavors. Um, like I said, it's come up before, but a solution hasn't really been identified. I think even from the federal point that the other rapidly growing states such as I would think Idaho, California, Florida, some of the other New York, that they would even have an interest in looking at that. Yeah, yeah. And I don't understand the complexities enough to, to understand, you know, how okay. we would do that, but we can certainly dive into it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on housing? Great. Moving on to the last of your top legislative priorities, which was the downtown quiet zones. Um, this was a new item on this year's legislative agenda um, and was a request from the city to ask for state assistance to make some of the operational and other improvements needed along the railroad tracks in order to get a, the um, FRA to designate a quiet zone. Um, we. Um, worked with Representative Pat Sullivan and then also Representative David Hackney um, in spearheading and developing this request to the Supplemental Operating Budget. However, every member of the Kent delegation was supportive and signed on to a letter in support. They all, in their own individual ways, weighed in. I will note that Representative Steve 
Steve Bergquist and Representative Mia Gregerson sit on the House Appropriations Committee in very um, influential roles, and we're well positioned to be able to shepherd this through the process. The final, um, so, so the way the budget process works in Olympia is one chamber releases a budget proposal and then the second chamber releases the proposal. And then the two chambers negotiate, the House and the Senate negotiate to then develop a final budget. The um, House proposal included $3 million in their supplemental operating budget. However, the Senate did not. And I want to emphasize that's not a reflection of a lack of support from our senators. It just didn't make the cut of the various investments that the Senate chose to make. So this one had me sitting on a little bit of pins and needles as we were waiting for final budget negotiations since we were in one budget but not the other and we needed to make sure we ha were included in the final. And, and um, thankfully we were, um, this funding was included in the final supplemental budget um, and Department of Commerce will be administering the funds. Um, and that there's no hang up on when these funds are coming. It will come within the biennium. And so it's unlike the transportation priorities, you, you all should see these investments occurring quickly and hopefully the work with the FRA um, can also move along quickly to get that quiet zone designated. Okay, good. So that concludes your top legislative priorities. I do want to highlight just a few items that were on your policy document um, and are worthy um, worthy honorable mentions of significant action this past session. The first is we're always concerned um, as, as the city about the state shared revenues that the state um, carves off a portion of and distributes out to all 281 cities. In previous years, we've seen the legislature reduce those funds to cities and create budget issues um, for you all. I'm pleased to share that not only were those state shared revenues fully funded, but they were slightly increased through through the budget. And that is really a byproduct of the extra revenue that the legislature had available to them in their operating budget. The legislature also dedicated significant funding through to small business support. They passed a significant piece of legislation providing B&O tax relief to businesses with gross revenues under 125,000. Um, that's uh, significant uh, to see a change in the BNO tax code and something we haven't seen in many years. Um, additionally, $200 million is allocated for economic development grants that will be administered over the next couple years, $34 million for small business recovery, and $25 million for assistance to small businesses, nonprofits, and arts organizations that struggled through pandemic. So um, definitely saw a significant area of investment there. And there was a lot of discussion around local planning. Um, we saw several different proposals that would have provided mandates to the city on how it goes about zoning middle housing types, duplex, triplex, all the way up to a sixplex throughout the community. We saw a proposal to integrate climate change into the Growth Management Act. Um, neither of those passed, but um, made a, a substantial way through the legislative process um, and certainly um, went through a lot of different conversation and review. Um, the legislature did, however, pass a bill um, on GMA comprehensive plan timelines to give you slightly more time to adopt your next comprehensive plan update and also allocated a significant level of funding for local government planning efforts, including a grant program for jurisdictions to undertake work to enhance the type of missing middle housing types within their community voluntarily. Um, I anticipate that the discussion around local planning, Growth Management Act, um, how climate fits into that, how housing fits into it, will be something we continue to talk about in future legislative sessions. The next issue to highlight for you all is um, that the legislature did approve changes to the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, those uh, will um, go into effect here very shortly. It allows uh, you the flexibility as a city to declare a local emergency and move into a virtual format if you view necessary. So once the governor's OPMA proclamation ends, you all as a, a, a council or the mayor can declare an emergency and choose to use a virtual format. So if there's a snowstorm or um, some other sort of major disaster, you, you all now will have that unilateral, unilateral authority. And then finally, the legislature continued um, uh, the trend of recent years of making significant investments in behavioral health and crisis stabilization 
Um, each year they're making significant investments that aligns with a larger vision of the deployment of the 988 system. Um, and so we continue to see that uh, this session. So those are just some highlights. There were dozens of other different bills that were discussed. I'm happy to uh, attempt to answer any of those uh, either um, this evening or follow up with you offline. I'm not going to confess to having every detail of every bill memorized. Um, as we look toward next steps, some things for you all to think about. First, in terms of the city uh, accomplishing its legislative priorities, this was an incredibly successful legislative session. Um, you all received all of your funding requests. They were fully accomplished. Um, the legislature responded to the request to revisit some of the police reform bills. Um, and so um, as far as the legislative priorities go, a successful session. And given that, I encourage you all to express appreciation to your legislators as you see them out in the community. Moving forward, um, there will be a general election in November of 2022 where half of the Senate and the entire House of Representatives is up for re-election. Um, we're seeing a large number of legislators choosing to not seek re-election for one reason or another. Um, we anticipate that number will be upwards of two dozen once we get past filing week in May. Uh, additionally, legislators will be seeking le election to new district boundaries as a result of redistricting. Um, and so it's unclear how those new redistricted boundaries will in impact election outcomes. We'll, of course, be watching the outcome of those elections very closely as it will influence and shape the makeup of the uh, political makeup of the 2023 legislature. What that means for us is over the coming months, I will prepare an interim action plan and begin preparing for the 2023 session, regardless of the political makeup. I think it's always important that the city of Kent outline what it needs and communicate it to legislators. And then of course, the 2023 legislative session begins on January 9th, 2023. Okay, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may still have. And I'll just conclude with saying it's a pleasure working on behalf of the city of Kent. You all have an incredibly responsive staff um, that gets me the information I need to be an effective advocate on your behalf. Um, and I greatly appreciate that all of your legislators from the 33rd, the 47th, and the 11th have an open door um, and work so collaboratively with me as your representative. Okay. Morelli, you do an awesome job. I mean, you really do a good job of keeping us updated throughout the session. Your reports are very thorough. And for some reason, I can't think of the guy named you replaced because I didn't think it's Doug. Was Doug. It? Yes, yeah, see, that's, Doug. see? Who is, Doug? <laughs> Who is Doug, right? So, no, but uh, you did a good job of just really stepping in and keeping us updated. And I just want to say we are very, very appreciative of uh, your work and your support for the city, especially the way you keep us involved in updates and so on. So I just want to say the bath for the council. We are uh, very thankful for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's so good to hear you actually read my reports. I never know. Yep. They oh, yeah. go off into the ether, and I wonder, did they catch that typo? Oh, yeah. They are very, <laughs> very thorough, and we read them. So, with that said, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Pleasure. All righty. And we look forward to your detailed report that comes out, okay? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. All righty. I think we are, are we adjourned. Ah, yes, we are adjourned till five o'clock. Thanks.